me just first give you kind of a little bit of, of our story um, and then some short-term mission stories, not particularly with dentists. And, and also, you're always nervous at a dentist group because you, know, you don't want to smile, you know. Um, but I tell you, we lived in the Middle East for 11 years, and um, if somebody knows you're a dentist, they will come and smile for you unlike I've never seen. I've had veiled Rashida women in the desert lift their veil to show me their teeth, thinking that I could do something about it. Um, so you guys have such a great opportunity. I'm, I really don't know how much I will tell you new. I think what you're gonna see is I, I'm gonna give you a little, little sheet in a minute of like top 10 cultural things and top 10 things to, to know and do as you prepare to go and as you go. But I think for most of you, having just listened to some of your stories already, it'll be stuff you know, but maybe stuff that you'll put a, a label on that you didn't know that you were already doing anyway, but now you'll know what they call that. <laughs> um, just a quick thing on for us, uh, this, is, uh, this is probably the last photo we took uh, in the Middle East. I've been back in America for seven years. Uh, my older son, I've got four boys. My older son on the right now is a um, Navy intel officer, and he lives down here in Chula Vista. So my wife and I are down there at his place. Uh, the one next to him, uh, the bigger kid sitting up is number two son, Ben. He is in the Ph.D. program at Golden Gate Seminary where I teach. Um, and little one there, John, now is 13, and he is... Uh, going into eighth grade in Brea. That's where I live now, Brea, California. I grew up in California. I'll give you a little more of that in a second. My wife is from Corsicana, Texas. We've been married 32 years. Number, number three son, Sam, in the red hat. Um, he went to college for about a year and a half and then couldn't really figure out what he wanted to do, so the number one son convinced him to join the Navy. So he's enlisted in the Navy, living in Norfolk, Virginia and just got back from one of those pirate hunting things there uh, where he said every time they caught pirates, they had to give them oranges, take their gas, and let them go. That's pretty much what they did. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> um, couldn't, because it's not an American program. It's a, like an international program, and that's what you do. You just give them oranges and let them go. We were, we were pretty shocked, but anyway, he's back in Norfolk. Um, we, um, uh, see, I grew up in Anaheim near Disneyland, uh, just up the road from here. I uh, went to Baylor University my first semester. Sick and hey, um, had a horrible experience, <laughs> but, um, but I, my wife went to Baylor, so that was good, but uh, anyway, at that point, Actually, that freshman year, being so far from California and not knowing anybody, I really just started reading the Bible for the first time and came across Isaiah 6, 8 that said, I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And I wrote that down in my Bible and felt like that was something I should be doing. Um, so uh, I ended up going to Southwestern. I pastored a church right by Love Field in Dallas for four years right across the runway. If you guys flew into Love Field, there's Denton Drive, my church, you know, railroad tracks. Um, and then I came back out to California and pastored the First Baptist Church in Barstow, California for six and a half years. And now their pastor's gone, so the last two years I've been up there in the desert preaching on Sundays. So I'm pretty much a preacher at heart. Um, while we were at Barstow though, we, um, ever since seminary, People would come and talk about missions and talk about the peoples of the earth. And so my wife and I would fill out the little commitment cards and raise our hands and cry and go forward and everything. And then, um, yeah, then I'd, I'd been at the church for about five years. Some of you guys have been there? Yeah. I'd been at the church about five years and we, uh, you know, we decided we've got to get this thing out of our system or just go on. You know, I'm either going to go into missions or, you know, full-time, or we're going to just stay here in Barstow. 
And so we uh, went further, we're Southern Baptists, we went further into our process, which is about now 20 steps. And finally they gave us job requests from around the world. And um, we looked at those and I remember looking through them and found one that was like a church planter in Thessalonica, Greece. And I thought, there you go, there, I can do that. Um, I've always liked, you know, Greek stuff, never did really do well in Greek in seminary, this could help me. Um, and then we kind of kept going through them, and then we found one that talked about the Bija people in eastern Sudan, that there were a million and a half Bija, one known believer. They had no Bible, no Jesus film, no radio, nothing, and it just said, we need somebody to go tell these people about Jesus. That's what the request said. And so my wife and I looked at each other. We had three small children at that time and um, just said, okay, if somebody told me in Barstow there were 200 people in a neighborhood that had never, had, never heard about Jesus, now that I have that information, I'm responsible to go. And now we know that there's a million and a half who've never heard, and now I'm, I'm responsible to go. And so we left our church the last day in 1992 and went to Jordan for a year and a half of Arabic study. And then we went to Sudan for two and a half years and then got kicked out of Sudan. And uh, that's a whole nother story. Then we ended up going back to Jordan for the next six years with six months in Cyprus in between. And uh, came back to America in 2004 and I uh, taught missions actually at Liberty University with Jerry Falwell for one year and had an incredible year there. Just want me to stand guess, there? Guess what? Okay. <laughs> I'll stand right here. So uh, I worked at Liberty for a year. And, um, there you go. You want that one? Yes, sir. I think it's coming. Thank you. <laughs> It's all right. Um, and after a year there, I uh, ended up just coming back to California and working at Golden Gate. Um, I'm going to leave a few of these little. I'm going to leave a few of these little magazines up here for you guys. If you if you'd like to know a little bit more about Golden Gate, uh, any of you guys Southern Baptists? Okay, Randy. Okay, and over there, good. Um, Southern Baptists have six seminaries. Golden Gate's the one in the West. Our main campus is in San Francisco. I was telling a group earlier, our windows in our chapel look out into San Francisco Bay, Alcatraz, and the city. It's a beautiful sight. So we're used to competition, you know, in trying to hold an audience. Um, but uh, we have five campuses, San Francisco, the one I'm at in Brea, Southern California. We've got one in Phoenix, Denver, and Portland. And uh, now about 66% of our programs online, that's all that the seminary accrediting people will let you have. If you're not accredited by the seminary accreditors and you just have like SACS or WASP, WASC or one of those other ones, you can do everything online, but this is a little bit about the seminary. Um, we've got uh, a missiology program that I'm kind of that I kind of do, and a uh, intercultural ministry program also. So that's a little bit about the seminary. A um, little little bit more about our story. So we ended up going to, uh, like I said, to Jordan for a year and a half to start on Arabic. Somebody asked me, you know, like, how long does it take to learn Arabic? And my answer is, well, I'll tell you when I'm, when I'm done, you know. It's, con it's just, it just continually grows. And depending on what country you're in is whether you actually know that Arabic. Uh, it's different from Jordan to Egypt to Sudan to Syria to Palestine. It's all different. And uh, especially the first 200 or so words that you use every day. Uh, but then we went to Sudan, um, and then my job went from like church planter, frontline guy telling Bible stories with flannel boards in Arabic to when we left, I was supervising 
our International Mission Board work in Chad, Sudan, Egypt, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, Northern Iraq, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and then off and on in Somalia and Djibouti, um, those places too. So some of you have been to those places. That's great. I'd love to hear your experiences. Um, some short-term stories, you know, receiving missionaries, I think on a career mission side, we probably wish missionaries overall uh, had a little more orientation and had a little better grasp of the strategy on the ground. And I'm going to give you some more insight on that in a minute. But uh, just a couple of, of stories. One good story, um, in, in places like Gaza and the West Bank, we use short-term teams and still do. And, and those short-term teams fit into a strategy, an overall strategy on the ground. So the best teams that we had were teams that were requested by the field, where the field had a desire to open up a particular area or, or give credibility to a local church or pastor or bring in uh, you know, a, a groups that were going to be part of a bigger strategy. And we, got, we saw that happen uh, a lot in the West Bank in Gaza. We had a great team leader over there, uh, whether it was food projects or health clinics and things like that. Um, those were great. We, we also uh, saw in northern Iraq, uh, and this is just kind of something that happens. You know, when the war was going on in Iraq, and remember when the statue fell down? Uh, you saw that on the news, and they were beating Saddam with their shoes and all that. As soon as that happened, everybody and their brother decided to come to Iraq. And there's something about people, too, going that makes you think that if I go to the most difficult place, then it must be better and more spiritual. I don't really agree with that. But at that point, uh, people, everybody and their brother was coming to, <laughs> to Jordan and then going to, to Iraq from Jordan. And uh, just like when the Soviet Union fell, you can read some really cool studies on that about what happened when the Soviet Union fell and Western missionaries rushed in. And a lot of good things happened, but a lot of things that happened because people weren't really prepared. Uh, in this particular situation, we had some just strange things happen. We had one, one uh, security guy at the airport in Jordan called us and said, hey, a team is here at the airport and they're coming in, they're saying they're working with you guys, and this one man has weapons and ammunition in his suitcases. So we go, and sure enough, it's some guy from Georgia. Anybody from Georgia here? <laughs> yeah, some old guy from Georgia who is on the side, he's like a part-time arms dealer. And he's decided, he's decided that in Iraq he needs to have his own protection, and he needs to have some samples of the weapons that he's looking for. So uh, we have to go kind of explain that. And all of that's just because somebody on this end didn't really get orientation before they went out on that end. Um, we also had a lady, and we were doing a project in Amman. Uh, and that's how you say Amman. It's actually Amman. So if you ever hear them on the news say Amman, Jordan, it's, they're, they're saying it wrong. That's just, I just have to tell you that. <laughs> Because when you hear me say Amman, you're sitting there thinking, he doesn't know how to say Amman, <laughs> does he? Yes, you're saying it wrong. Um, but we had a, a team out, and uh, this, as we had, we were going to a group uh, of homes to just minister in these homes, and the, the driver and the missionary, the driver was an Iraqi, and the missionary was talking, they were talking back and forth, and there was a woman in the, in the van from the volunteer team who hadn't taken her medicine that day and hadn't told anyone that she needed to be on this medication or she got extremely paranoid. And so she jumped out of the van in traffic, ran to the police station and said that the missionary and the driver, the Iraqi, were trying to kidnap her and take her into Iraq. <laughs> So, you know, we called the pastor and said, how did this lady get in the group? And, you know, no one really knows these things, and she should have been on her medication. But, all again, all that is mostly preparation here takes care of a lot of that once you get there. So uh, what I want to do this morning is I want to give you a little handout. 
um, and let you, we're going to talk about, um, I've got two things, yeah, thanks, if you do that, yeah, the, the top ten cross-cultural concepts you need to know, and then top ten insights to increase the impact of your trip before you go and while you're there, okay? Um, and, and I know that I'm not covering everything. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't have, you know, a lot of things that I'm hoping are assumptions like you are, in a, you are active in a church. I, I guess I shouldn't assume that, but you, we, I would assume you are, that um, you know the Lord, that uh, you're, you read the Bible, that you pray. I don't, I don't have those as top ten things you have to do before you go because I'm hoping that, that we're doing those, you know. But um, what I'm going to try to do is spend like two minutes on each one. And then if you want to stop and at, when I'm done and we'll talk more about one or the other, then we can, we can do that, okay? Um, just so you know about short-term missions, people that are, people that are long-term on the field, and these are people that have one-way tickets, you know what that's like when you go to the field and you have a one-way ticket you, you don't have a return so uh, remember the old guys they they'd leave from the east coast of america pack their belongings in a casket and uh, just say We're, we'll see in fact when i left barstow i told my friends i said i'll see you guys in heaven i really never thought i would ever come home from sudan ever um but um when you uh well, these days short-term missions is, is incredibly effective and can be incredibly ineffective and is huge. Uh, where are people going? I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but this is just where people go these days. Tourists, people that are studying abroad, and short-term mission teams. Um, and you can see those first five of where short-term teams are going are pretty close. I think that's okay. I mean, there'll be some that look at that and go, well, there's just too much stuff going on in Central America. I, I don't know that I think that that's bad. I think that's a good first place to go. Um, I respect and admire those guys. I've got a buddy in, in Tennessee. His brother is a mail carrier. He's a pharmacist at, at uh, Walgreens. He found out that his great-grandfather had gone to Nicaragua and Honduras with Mark Twain, and his great-grandfather stayed. He figured out, well, I've got to have some relatives down there. So he went down there. He found out he's got some relatives. Uh, then he decided there was so much poverty that he saw there that he wanted to do something about it. So this pharmacist in, Mem in uh, West Tennessee in Brownsville started this ministry in Nicaragua and Honduras that's a great work down there. And, he, and a lot of people go because it's pretty easy. It's one time zone. You can leave Houston and be there you know, before you can go to New York. You don't lose any sleep. Uh, unless people know there's, there's a bunch of mission teams going, it's pretty inexpensive. But a lot of those places are, are close. The other thing I figured out I'm just, this is way off track, but I've figured this out too. Remember in America, uh, I asked my students at Golden Gate in evangelism classes, how many of you guys have been to a revival service? And in California, I can tell you, if I've got a class of 25 students, none of them had revival services at their churches last year. None. They had trunk or treats on Halloween. They had Easter egg hunts, but nobody had a revival service. What I figured out is a lot of the guys that used to do full-time revival evangelism are doing that now in these top five or six countries. They're going to Central America and that you can still hold a crusade at a stadium and still fill the place. And so a lot of those guys have moved their ministries down there too. But I guess most of you have probably been to those countries on the left side, don't you? Wouldn't you think so? Anybody been to Haiti? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kenya, somebody just got back from there. Brazil, yeah. Um, 
Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, yeah. And then that's interesting just where tourists are going and where students are, are going. Uh, so people are going. If you want to know how many people, today we don't even count. People were counting for a while, but the growth of short-term missions and, and just how, oh, in this book, this is what we had when we went to Sudan. We hoped we never had to use it, but we did have it. Yeah. Have you, do you guys have that book? Do you give it out? Yeah. Even the, you know, just the, the picture on the front frightened me, you know? I never wanted to be anybody sitting between somebody's knees with tools in my mouth. Just didn't look good. All right, sorry, I'm done with my coffee. I'm going to move now. Um, but why, why is that happening? I mean, the world's just smaller, isn't it? You, you, you can, you know, in 1840, the fastest you could go is 10 miles an hour. Today, you can be anywhere in the world now. And you guys do that. You know, you can, you can, the weirdest thing, it's like space time travel. When you leave Korea or China and you get back to San Francisco before you left. Isn't that weird? Have you ever experienced that? That something's wrong there. Don't you think? It's, it's got to not, it's not right. For you to leave and at three in the afternoon and get and to get to San Francisco and have breakfast it's before you left. It's strange. Um, there are there are thousands of groups that are sending people now, and so that's another reason why people are going. Remember, years ago the the mission organizations had all the information. If you wanted to go to Central America, if you wanted to go to India, you had to go through somebody who held all the power and all the knowledge, and they were the ones that told you, how do you get there? Today, you want to go anywhere in the world, you can do it now. And there's all kinds of organizations that are sending. So these, these huge churches, like the, uh, we just called them the Waco people, the big church in, in Waco that sends out M's. Uh, we had them in Sudan, they're in hard places. Uh, Saddleback, if you guys know anything about California, right up the road with the peace plan, uh, their goal is to have like every one of their 3,000 to 3,500 small groups out on short-term international missions. Uh, they've got a whole staff that's just missions now at Saddleback. So we've seen all of that happening and, and all kinds of different groups uh, sending, going, it's just an explosion. Oh, in fact, I read one uh, statistic that said in mega churches, 90% of youth before age 17 have been on some kind of short-term trip. Which change, it's just, that's just different. You never saw that, you know, 20 years ago. All right, on your sheet, let's, let's take just, and I'm, I will honor the time, because I'm going to honor the time. Uh, just let's work, work through that first page. Um, I brought several books I'll leave up here for you, and maybe you guys are familiar with them. But um, this, let's see, this book is kind of the classic serving with eyes wide open, doing short-term short, short missions with cultural intelligence. And that's kind of a key word that's floated around out there now among people that study this kind of stuff is cultural intelligence. There's, a, there's an assessment in the back of, of a second book that he has that'll help you, and I didn't print this one up for you, but it's like a cultural intelligence survey where you can rate yourself to see if you are culturally intelligent. Do you think you need to do that? Anyway, if you do, check this book out. Um, there's one other one that I like. This is more my speed. It's only 124 pages called Ministering Cross-Culturally. Sherwood Lingenfelter was at Biola. Now he's at Fuller. And he's got in here the best little assessment that'll help you group yourself in these, these values. And I'm going to show you those in just a minute. And I actually printed out just shrunk that down without his permission uh, to one page so you could see what this looks like. 
and, and kind of rate yourself uh, in these values, and you'll see that in one second. And I'll, so at the break, I'll leave that up here if you want to take a look. Okay, so let's, uh, let's just jump into this. I like David Livermore says, the biggest problems in short-term missions are not technical or administrative. So it's not that you don't know what you're doing technically. You sure do. Uh, the biggest challenges are communication, misunderstanding, personality conflicts, poor leadership, and bad teamwork. And probably you guys have experienced parts of all of that if you've ever had an experience that wasn't so positive. So I want to give you 10 things that I think are important to know in just your communication understanding sort of uh, approach to, to where you go and what you do. The, so here you go. Uh, number one, just understand the word culture. So culture, simply a learned system of meanings that help you make sense and explain what's going on. Uh, it's just culture is just the soup that you swim in every day. It's, uh, it's what told you right now that you sit in a chair it's what tells you how to get your coffee, how to dress, uh, how to behave in a meeting like this where you're all sitting there quietly, calmly. Culture tells you all that. Uh, how men and women react and interact together. Uh, it's, it's, oh, well, it tells you how to make bread in northern Iraq like that, um, that you have a big oven and you stick a stick in there and you put the bread on top. Uh, it tells you uh, your way of life, how you cope with life. It's a learned pattern. You watch your, your parents, you watch people in your family doing these things. Um, when you talk about culture, there's three basic parts to it. So there's the cognitive part, and that just tells you um, how to do things. It's knowledge how to do everything from running a government to relating to ancestors. Your culture tells you that. Um, it tells you uh, n this knowledge in everything that they produce, in stories and poems and dances and rituals. It's all stored there. Uh, there's the effective dimension. This one's interesting. It tells you what things are pretty and what things aren't, what kind of food is good, what kind of food's not things you like and you dislike. And you guys have experienced all that, haven't you? Remember where you go to some other country and you're like, wow, I just can't believe those guys like that. That food is just so hot. That's just, that's just the way they like it. Um, or how people dress. How can they wear that outfit out there in the middle of the desert like that? They should be in a pair of capris and you know, a tank top or something. But things, what's beautiful and what's not. Um, yeah, beauty is interesting, too. Uh, in Sudan, um, you know, larger people are more beautiful. That's why we like being there, you know. Um, but uh, some cultures, some culture, because if you're large, that means you're, you're doing well, you're, you're blessed. And, you know, who wants to look like a refugee in eastern Sudan? Nobody. Um, but those cultures tell you those things. What, what's pretty? what's not, um, different tastes. So, and then there's the evaluative dimension, how you judge relationships, whether they're moral or immoral. Can you have more than one wife? What about this job? What about that job? Um, in, in the Middle East, often, you'll see a guy with a long little fingernail. You guys ever seen that? If you have a long little fingernail, that means you don't do any manual labor. You don't dig ditches. If you have a little, long little fingernail, that means you're higher than that. And um, I was in Egypt one of the early times was talking to the taxi driver as we were driving by. And I said, hey, in Egypt, uh, who collects y'all's trash on the streets? And he said, well, Egyptians do. Because in Jordan, Egyptians clean Jordanian streets. A Jordanian would never clean that street. And in Egypt, this country right next door, that's why you're going to have to figure out where you are, what's going on in that culture. Because right next door, in, e in Egypt, the guy tells me, no, in Egypt, every job is a high job. Every job is appreciated. So whether it's the guy sweeping the streets or whether it's the guy you know, in the office, nobody's got the long fingernail in Egypt. 
But uh, those cultures are going to tell you, this is, what about a caste system? You know, these people don't relate to these people. And how's that affect you, you know, when you're doing your work there, if people from multiple groups are hanging around and what, who's that, how's that affect who you actually minister to first or does it? Um, levels of culture, this is kind of fun. So we've got Western culture, and then within Western culture, we've got, let's say, German, French, American. That's all Western. And then within Asian, you've got different, different layers. And then in America, you've got subcultures. So that culture in, when you guys watch that show Swamp People, anybody watch that? Yeah, isn't that fun? You watch those guys, and like that culture is totally different from Southern California culture. The guys that are here at, at Ocean Beach and the guys that are Swamp People boys, that's totally different. But it's still a piece of Western culture. It just unfolds more and more and more. Um, you see culture in how people behave. It's that set of rules that governs their life. Uh, it's, uh, it's what they do and who they are. So that my little, uh, when my son John was four, he had above us was Abu Sam. This is our landlord in Jordan. And John uh, would crawl out of our house up the stairs to the middle layer, which was where Abu Sam and his wife lived. And this, this 70 year old Jordanian basically raised our boy from the time he was like uh, old enough to crawl until he was five. And uh, what we noticed is that this, this five-year-old that we had, he talked and he walked like a 70-year-old Jordanian. <laughs> Seriously, we'd see him, we'd see him walking, you know, like this. And uh, Abu and Sam, we'd see them both walking together. It was just the craziest thing. And then you'd hear John speaking English, and he would say, and the man, he put his hand in for the fox and he grabbed the fox and just talking just like a Jordanian guy. Well, that's how cultures learn. People watch it, they grow it, they live in it, and um, you, you see it. People in cultures produce stuff. You know, they produce artifacts. And when you bring stuff home, you bring stuff home from those cultures. Maybe a mat, maybe a bag uh, that somebody's knitted out of plastics or old materials, or it may be something that that culture does that's unique to that culture. Um, if you've ever watched Fiddler on the Roof, you guys ever watched that first part where he says, why do we do these things? He's like, I'll tell you, I don't know. We just do them because that's the way we do them. Um, all right, second thing related to that is worldview. So wor culture is stuff that you see, worldview is stuff that, um, that is driving why they do that. Any of you guys been to Malaysia? Um, this is actually a Hindu uh, ceremony in Malaysia called Thai Pusan. And there's this huge statue uh, in the distance in about 400 steps. And these pilgrims have to march up these steps and yeah those are hooks that are in this guy's back and uh, after the break I've got a little video I may show you that of this people like this that are doing this but culture is okay I can see that worldview is why in the world does he do that so worldview is what's underneath that says why do people do the things that they do um, and, and that's something that is, is something hopefully on your world, on your short term trips, you can start getting to worldview of why people are the way they are, why they do the things that they do. So when we interact with people from our own culture, we, we can fill in the blank of why they do what they do. When you enter, when you interact with people from other cultures, you need energy to figure out why are they doing the things that they're doing? Cause they're different. We don't understand those things. Worldview is why we do these things. Uh, why do we, after a church service in Sudan, line everybody up around the corner and everybody shakes everybody's hand? Well, it's the worldview is hospitality is a value. Greeting people is a value. 
And so you, that value moves what you're doing on the surface. Uh, it's the deep level of culture. In fact, some people use an uh, uh, iceberg to, as a, a descriptor of what culture and worldview looks like. One is on the surface. One is underneath that drives everything. Worldview affects how you face issues in life. So evil and suffering, what causes that? Your worldview tells you that. One worldview may say uh, it's because you don't work hard enough. One worldview may say it's because there's demons. They're in the trees. They're in the rocks. Uh, one wor worldview may say riches and prosperity, that riches is the goal. You ought to be prosperous. Other worldview may say, no, actually it's relationships that are the, the top priority. So worldview affects everything, uh, all of these different issues in life. Um, you, there, let me give you four questions that worldview tries to answer. Oh, and this is another lady from that Thai Pusin celebration. See that trident in her, in her mouth? Yeah, so her worldview says, for me to be uh, accepted by God slash gods, I have to uh, put this trident in my mouth and carry this bottle of milk up these steps. Now, here's one other thing, though, related to this. Worldview, okay, let me give you these four questions. Worldview answers these questions. Is there a God? How does he relate to us? Where did I come from? Why am I here? What happens when I die? How do we know right from wrong? Why is there good and evil? And then power and authority. What's truth? How do we know it? What's the source of authority? Worldview answers those questions. Now think about this. Um, there, there's how many billion people on earth right now? Six to seven, eight? What is it? Who knows? How many Christians are there on earth? Maybe a billion? That means that for five to six billion other people, they've got a worldview that answers these questions in life that makes it where they can get up and function every day. And if you ever really talk to a Hindu or you talk to a Buddhist or you talk to a Muslim, and sometimes we think, wow, they must really uh, you know, wake up every day thinking, I've got to find another way. This way is just not working. No, the reason there are a, a billion Muslims is Islam works for them because that worldview answers all those questions. The, the reason there's nearly a billion Hindus is even though you stick a trident in your face, that, that trident and that sacrifice answers the question of how do we relate to the gods. This is how you do it. Uh, so they don't wake up every day thinking, laying on their bed in the morning thinking, wow, I just wish there were some other way. Uh, Satan has them convinced that their way answers their questions. And that's what worldview does. So anytime you're going anywhere else, uh, you're going to see worldview and you're going to see that lived out, you know, right, right around you. Uh, cultural intelligence, just a couple of words on that. This is kind of the, the catchphrase right now that's going on, where you move from unconscious incompetence. So for us in my culture in the Middle East, that would mean unco unconscious incompetence is I go to a meal uh, and first I invite my wife to, to sit with all the men. You don't do that. So I'm, un I'm, I'm incompetent just because I'm ignorant. Right? And I also go to that meal and I use my left hand. I don't use my left hand. How come? Because you use your left hand for all kinds of other bad things, like going to the bathroom when you have your little, you guys have used those little pitchers, little plastic things when you have to go to the bathroom and you do all that. Uh, so I move from being just ignorant, I'm incompetent unconsciously, to unconscious competence. Now I don't even have to think about it. Now I'd never put my foot out in front of somebody else. Uh, now I would never, you know, ask somebody where their wife is uh, if I'm at a dinner. Uh, now I would never, you know, eat before the host was seated or whatever the other cultural rule is. You're, you're growing to where you're learning more and more 
what is it like in that particular culture. That doesn't mean you have to be afraid or that you have to go, well, and there's no reason to ever go again because I'm never going to learn anything. No, it just means you're just you're committed to continuing to grow. Realize it's a growing process and um, take these cultural uh, intelligence assessments. Ethnographies, I think this is a great term to know. And this is a lot of fun where you just discover uh, what's going on around you. One of the things I like to do, and I get our students to do it, and you should too, wherever you go, and you, many of you probably already do this, you just find a, a coffee shop or you find a, a, a place outside. In most every culture, people have places where they sit at tables where life's going on around them, and just take a piece of paper and just describe what you see happening. Who's interacting with who? Who are the merchants? Who are buying things? In cultures, are the men buying things, are the women buying things, or are the servants buying things? Because you're going to have one of those. Are the kids buying things? Who's selling things? Who's selling vegetables? Who's selling meats? Who's making breakfast? And just sit and for an hour or so just kind of sketch it out. It's a lot of fun where you just sort of, dis in, through your observation, you see what's happening there. Uh, and, and ask questions. Uh, get, ask some of those worldview questions if you have somebody you can talk to. And then you try to create this ethnographic core of what does somebody in the center of that people group look like. And these are actually, the, this is who really missions is after. In the long run, the first people that generally get saved, especially if you're going to a, a people group that hasn't heard the gospel much, the people that get saved generally are people on the fringes, people that are educated, that have contact with Westerners. You know, have you guys worked with Muslims? UOM people have, I'm sure. Um, and I was just great to see the pictures of OM because we worked with OM in Sudan and the Middle East. And the work they do with Muslims is, is incredible. Um, but, but for Muslims, we have to go to heads of household. Uh, that's the person we're after. And the typical convert for Muslims is... Uh, he's an 18 to 21 year old boy who's estranged from his family, uh, hates his father, doesn't have a job, and he's connected to Westerners. And that's the kind of kid that kind of comes in. But we're looking in missions ultimately toward that ethnographic center. Who is really the person in that people group that we want to touch base with? And for me, it's, uh, it's Abu Salam right here. Abu Salam is a Muslim man in Gaza, and this is a typical Muslim family in Gaza, and he's the guy in Gaza that I want to I want to get to know him. And I want I want whatever ministry I'm doing to connect with the ethnographic core. These are decision makers, power brokers, they're more stable, more rural. These are the traditional people in that people group. The people on the fringe, if you've ever gone to China, uh, I took a bunch of Liberty students to China, and the people on the fringe in China are students that are going to meet with a bunch of other students. They're educated, they're more urban, they're mobile. Uh, but the, doing your ethnography is going to teach you what, what's out there and who are these people. Okay, give me just a couple minutes. <clears throat> uh, well, I may stay on this one a minute, and then we can take a break and come back. Uh, this Lingenfelter book talks about these values. And I would guess when you're on your short-term trips, these are the things that you're going to come up against more than anything, just because they're so evident and, and you're going to, you're, you clash with them so often. And that is these values that a whole culture holds. Now, in every culture, everybody has a little bit of different value. You know, some of you, even in this room, some of you probably... Uh, would watch a PG-13 movie. Some of you probably would watch an R movie. Some of you wouldn't watch any of those and you've taken the, the, the television out in the backyard and you've blown it up with a shotgun. I had a friend in seminary that did that. But within our culture, you know, there are levels. But in general, we do hold certain values together. So you are got to figure out, is the culture you're going to individualistic or collective? And that's going to be one of the biggest things that you'll see depending on what country you go to. Is it a country like America that says you're important, your rights, your needs, or is it a group thing? And is it more like, you know, you're calling one person to come to Christ, 
Or is it more like Cornelius and the Philippian jailer when once that one guy went, the group went? So there are cultures like that uh, where you have uh, group-oriented or individual-oriented. That's why in America, you know, we're, we always usually call for a personal, you know, you make a personal decision to receive Christ. In another culture, we're doing that also. But we're also taking into account that if you do that, then you've given up Christmas, Easter. I mean, if you're a Muslim and you do that, you give up Ramadan, Eid al-Adha, your community and everything. You're leaving all that. Which is why there's a, there's a whole field out there of contextualization. That's another word. That's word eight on your list. All right, let me just keep going. Um, large, and power, large and small power distances. <clears throat> These are kind of fun. You know, can you be chummy with the boss or not? Uh, in Jordan, to get a, a package at the, at the, the uh, post office, I used to draw people maps. There were 10 steps to get to. Before you got to, the last guy was the mudir. And the mudir had a cigarette and a glass of tea and a newspaper and a rubber stamp. Every country that you go to that we would say traditionally is like a third world country, you're going to find the guy with a rubber stamp. And, and a guy with keys. That's the most powerful guy there. And uh, until you don't get anything done, and guess the guy with the rubber stamp is gone. And if he's not there, it makes big trouble. You know, if he's at a wedding somewhere, you wait till he comes back. Nobody in those cultures, nobody gets to fill in for that guy. So this huge power distance in those countries. Uh, male and female roles. So you're going to find some countries where women can do everything that men can do, such as my favorite little country in Africa that's now messed up called Eritrea. Anybody ever been to Eritrea? Eritrea is what used to be part of Ethiopia. It's the coastal area of Ethiopia. Wonderful little country until the leader just went nuts about 10 years ago and started fighting with Ethiopia again and cracking down on Christians. But in that, in that culture, women and men fought alongside each other against Ethiopia for years. And so it's an African country where male and female roles are shared. Uh, and, but you have to figure that out. In the country you go to, you have to figure out what's, what's going on here. Can you relate to women and men the same? I, I did a, um, years ago... I, from Jordan, I flew over to Brazil. My boss in Jordan was now the regional leader in Brazil. So I went over to Brazil to do like a training for his missionaries. In Jordan, I went for several years without ever speaking to a woman on the street. That's how distinct male and female roles were. You know, in America, you're walking by and here comes a woman or a couple of people, a couple of ladies with a couple of kids, and you might go, howdy, how you doing? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, you don't do that there. And so I went all that time without speaking to, to women. I'd just talk to missionary women, but still, you know, I'd rather talk to guys. That's just the way we did it. And I went to this mission meeting in Brazil, and it was a room like this, and the missionary women were in there, and the missionary women had on... Uh, tops with no sleeves and I remember just kind of feeling uneasy like like I needed something here you know like I don't want to look for, I don't want to look at their shoulders you know just how distinct those cultures can affect you and how distinct those male and female roles are so in America pretty much roles overlap uh, in other countries uh, this is my wife and a couple of her Sudanese friends that she met in the market. Women are modest, clear roles defined. Let me give you one more and I promise I'll stop because I know you're getting there. Yeah, I got a couple more of these. Time, anybody experience this on your short-term trip? All right, the clinic starts at 10 and it's like, you know, now it's 10 to 11 and you're going, they said it was gonna start at, well, it starts when everybody gets there. That's what happens. Well, but we've got to end right at two because, you know, that's when the bus is leaving and we're going to all get back. No, just, just go with it. You think about like England. What does a clock in the middle of the city tell you? This is a country that's run on time. And in other countries, 
uh, they don't run so much on that. They start when everybody gets there. It's an event. So you've got time and event orientation. And a lot of the countries you go to are going to have real differences on that. And frankly, me and my family, we work better on event. My wife thinks if church starts at 11 o'clock in America, that's when you leave the house. That's what she thinks. So it works a lot better when we're not in America because we're usually the first ones there. Yeah, instead of not. Uh, space, you guys have all seen this, different countries on space. Um, how close do you get to people? Do you touch men or, or do you touch women? Do you kiss guys? Uh, do you, you know, how, how do you relate? What, what's the, the, the amount of space that you need between one person and another? Uh, how, do those, how do those cultures relate with, with touch? Um, and, and how do we mark boundaries? See, so you guys already came in this morning and you marked where you were going to sit. How? You put a book there, your code or something, but you marked your space. And um, you've all been to these things where, you know, the chairs are real close together. What do we do in our, in our culture? We kind of, you know, move them just a little bit apart. You know, I need a little bit more space. Whereas some cultures, you know, the, the, the more jammed in, the better. That's just, that's just part of it. So space is a fun one. Uh, in, in America, generally, we want 20 inches. If somebody, you guys ever seen field as a close talker? You ever had a close talker? You know, right up next to you, you know? Uh, so we've got our own space, whereas in the Middle East, I took a group from Golden Gate. We got off the plane in Amman, and um, my old Jordanian friend came up, and we just started kissing each other. You know, and all of my, Jordan, all of my Golden Gate friends were like, well, that's weird, you know? But uh, that's just what you do. Men hold hands on the street, no big deal. Uh, how, do you, how do you relate on space? Uh, self, this is all something that's going to come up in just a minute, too, on face saving. Uh, and then this, this one is, is less, you don't see this much. But this is a fun one. It's like, where do you control what happens in your life, or does outside stuff control it? And you'll find cultures that relate to that. In America, generally, we think we're in control. In outside other cultures, they usually think, well, you know, I'm going to do the best I can, but um, fate, karma, even in, with Muslims, they'll say, inshallah, that just means if God wills, then it's going to take place. But uh, who's, in, who's in control? All right, let me, let's see, face, face saving, just one quick word on that. You just have to, in the culture you're going to, you know, there's some cultures where we tend to uh, want to get right to the heart of the matter to solve a problem. And some cultures kind of go around in circles. And part of that is that there's just face saving. So to humiliate somebody, for them to lose standing, for them to be perceived as wrong, that's, that, that's a big deal. Um, and uh, depending on where you are, you're going to find different ways to do conflict. This was when we were at Liberty, we had this six foot eight center on the women's basketball team. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> Katie, huh? Oh, you do, right, yeah. Katie Feenstra, she went to the WNBA, but this is number three son with her. When I got to be coach for the day, just because I mentioned them in a chapel address at Liberty, they let me go sit on the bench. That was so fun. Um, but in conflict, you know, we tend to want to just kind of get right to it and, um, you know, or, or emotionally charged, you know, but even though you may not really feel that emotional, you're just going to get a little louder. And then some countries, you know, do a little more, uh, you know, avoiding of conflict, uh, some, you know, a little more restraint, but depending on where you're going, just see what's that like, you know, how do I know if it's a face culture? Uh, a lot of Asian cultures, you know, you just don't want to, you don't want to do anything to humiliate that person, and, and we wouldn't want to do that anyway, but any affront, you know, to, well, I think this could have been done differently in front of his employees and something, and he loses face. So how much do I have to keep an, a favorable image of myself? How much do I have to put into others? So just know that about your culture, uh, whether it's honor and shame. 
uh, which is, again, the cultures that I'm most familiar with in the Middle East, why we have um, these honor killings that happen because somebody has heard a rumor that their sister has had an affair with somebody, and so they uh, have to kill their sister to rid, rid the family of this dishonor. So some culture, more than others, huge on honor and shame, uh, and you have to just kind of know where you're going, what that's like. Um, Nonverbal communication, so we're still on just cultural concepts. Everywhere you go, you're gonna communicate nonverbally. Everything you do communicates nonverbally. I don't know who gets this message. And now this guy is definitely communicating something, and he's not saying anything. This is in Israel. Who was going there? You guys in the back. Um, this is, we just found this sign, vegetarian singles dating service. That's a pretty narrow window, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> and I don't know whoever came up with 65% is verbal. It's like all statistics, what is it? What is it, the statistic is 90% of all statistics are made up, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, we do communicate by what we do, how we move, the uh, way we look, um, you know, generally our facial expressions, sad, angry, uh, disgust, uh, frightened, interest, uh, sadness, um, happiness, all of these are ways that we just, through your face, you communicate. Um, Nonverbal cues, you know, show us what these people are like, what they do, where they live. So this guy, you know, he's from Central America. This guy's from Northern Iraq. They're not saying anything, but they're communicating all that. And you'll see, you'll see that in the cultures you go to. Um, let's see. Contextualization is the, the process of making the gospel and the church as much at home as possible in a given cultural context. This is going to, just hang on to this thought, when we turn the page in a minute, you're going to see how that applies when we talk about bridges and barriers to the gospel. Again, my, my wife with her best friend Miriam, who even though we've been friends with Miriam and Nihad now almost 20 years, they're still Muslims, in fact, more committed Muslims than ever. Isn't that, isn't that something? It's like through our friendship with them, they've become more committed Muslims. Actually, um, you just, just part, of, part of understanding culture. Such a collectivist culture, meaning the group is so important. Her, even though Miriam used to not veil, her dad on his deathbed said, I want you to be a good Muslim and I want you to start veiling, and so she did. So she's, not, she's from a culture that honors her father. She's from a culture that is group-oriented, and all of that created her and her family to be more committed Muslims, even though you know they've known us. You can see our influence for 20 years. But why does it matter? Contextualization matters because reaching people in their cultural context matters. That's why you have the gospel in different languages. That's why you, uh, you, you speak another language, you enter into their culture. That's called contextualization. What it all looks like, you got one person here, one person there, they're trying to communicate, there's all these things that are going on in the middle, and you hope that what you're trying to tell them gets through. Uh, for, for us, and many, many times you've got person A going through, I could add another translator guy here, and then to person B. So this exchange process, when you're trying to communicate with somebody, even goes through another person which is legend among missionaries that are on the ground when evangelist from the south comes to, to East Africa. And evangelist from the south is telling a story that people in Georgia would understand and laugh at. And so the translator just tells the people listening, he's telling you a story, and the guy's out there saying, yeah, a man had these three dogs. And he, you know, he went down to the, to the Piggly Wiggly and uh, left the dogs in the car. You know, and as he's telling that story, the translator just says, this man's telling you a funny story. When I tell you to laugh, I want you to laugh. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> and, 
And it just happens just like that. And the guy's like, wow, they just connect. I connected to them so well. It's true, isn't it? Which is another thing, you know, in, um, in, in listen, in, in group cultures where there's shame and honor, if you're a visitor to that culture and, and, I, and all of y'all want to honor me, and I ask all of you, how many of you would want right now to receive Christ? And none of you want to disappoint me. And so what do you do? Yeah. And so I, you know, there's 25 people <clears throat> that, that got saved. Uh, so understanding that culture is going to help. Um, in contextualization, sometimes we have to ask, what, how much should you look like in that culture? And this is more of, a, of an issue for long-term missionaries, but short-termers have it too. Uh, do you wear a Jalabia? The, the, the teams that I worked with in Chad, the Western missionaries all wore Jalabias. And the women all wore tobes. This is a Sudanese family. Um, but that's one of the questions, you know, do you do, you do that? Uh, in answering that question, you have to just be real sensitive to say, well, what are people wearing in that country? Generally, you want to be modest, but for you, for you as a short-term person, like um, Gail was saying, he's been in Djibouti with some people that I know, working with the Afar. The Afar are just one of the, they're one of the, I mean, they're on the edge, unreached people group in Djibouti and Ethiopia. Uh, some of those Afar women don't wear much at all, um, but for he and his wife to go dress like the Afar, <laughs> that's just not smart. <laughs> and, listen, makes a great PowerPoint. Makes a great, <laughs> are those, are those going to be on, they're going to be on the website. Um, but it, 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 it would look, it would look, no, I'm not sure what it would look like. <laughs> it would look about as silly as, as a couple of Korean missionaries going to Glendale, Arizona, dressed up like cowboys. Like, that just doesn't, doesn't really fit, you know? Well, we're trying to reach those people, you know, between Tucson and Phoenix, and <laughs> might need them. <laughs> All right. You guys have got it. Culture shock. You've, you guys have all talked about that. Culture shock. What's that look like? Um, the stressful transition period when you move from a familiar environment to an unfamiliar one. Sometimes you experience this on a short-term trip. Most of the time, on a short-term trip, when there's light at the end of the tunnel, you, you, you pretty much stay in this first. Everything is new, exciting, and different. Sometimes you drop into this. By the time you're going home, sometimes you reach the second level here where you're like, these people just don't do anything right. You know, can't they, can't they go to bed at the right time? Yeah, I had a Liberty University student with me. We were in Galilee, and we were at a hotel there, and it was during some Hebrew Jewish festival, and people were partying in the hotel till 11:30 or so at night. She came down. She was a Korean Liberty student. She came down from the hotel into the guest room where people were partying, this banquet hall, and asked them if they could be quiet because she was trying to sleep. <laughs> she she'd hit the wall already right here. Uh, but you know, if you're on the ground, usually you go like this. You kind of, you know, everything's fun. You know, it's neat. And one of the guys at my home church now, he likes to go somewhere every year, and he always he always books a European city going and a European city coming back from India or wherever. Uh, and everything for Jim pretty much is right here. It's all new, exciting, and different. But when you stay an extended period of time, you get tired of having to squat to go to the bathroom. You, you get tired of cold showers. You don't know why they can't just fish the ants out of their tea before they give you the tea. You don't understand that. <laughs> and you get kind of frustrated. <clears throat> and then you kind of adjust. And uh, that goes maybe one more dip. The only dip I ever had here is we'd been in Sudan for four years. And we were here. We'd been in Sudan for four years. We got out. And we went to a 
conference in, in Interlaken, Switzerland. Any of you guys been there? Okay, Interlaken, Switzerland is it's the photo negative of Khartoum, Sudan. Imagine blue water to brown water. Uh, uh, clean streets to dirty streets. Uh, function to dysfunction. Everything exactly the opposite. And when we came back into Sudan for about three days, <clears throat> we were just in the bed and, you know, around, sitting around the house just kind of rocking back and forth. I don't want to go outside. <laughs> I don't. Uh, dependency. <clears throat> dependency is a word um, that you hear related to missions. That's the unhealthy reliance on foreign resources, personnel, ideas that stifles local initiative. Now, I've already heard from you guys enough to know that often where you're going, uh, you're training dentists to do this as well. And you're handing over what you're doing and you're encouraging people on the ground to do the work that you're doing too, to do preventive care, to do assessments and things like that. Uh, dependency is, an example of dependency is a uh, mission team from, let's take my wife's hometown, Corsicana, goes down to Central America. Uh, they bring a team of builders, <clears throat> they build a church down there, uh, they bring about $5,000 to support the pastor and the staff there for a while. Uh, two years later, the pastor down in Central America calls the church in Corsicana and says, hey, can you send the men down again to fix your church? And they're like, what, what do you mean, our church? No, the church you guys built down here, it's leaking. We need you guys to come down here and fix it. And they're like, well, no, you guys should fix it. And we don't have the resources to fix it. We also need tile. You know, we've been on this concrete for a couple of years now. We need you guys to come down and tile it also. So come down and fix your building. That's dependency, where you don't, where local initiative sits and waits. And if you ask the local people, when are you guys going to plant a new church? Their answer is when the guys from Texas come back. So you don't, you don't want to create that. And, and I don't think you guys are. From what I'm hearing, you guys are, you know, part of a local strategy, empowering people on the ground. Um, so that, okay, there we go, break. I'm not going to, I did have Sudanese fool for you. Uh, not really, but this was, <laughs> I should have had my wife make that. You would have loved it. It's fava beans and cheese, onions, and this is what you eat, you eat every day. Um, okay, let me just say on why we got kicked out of Sudan. Somebody had asked at the break. Um, we had a, so we were working, we were, I'll tell you this and then we're going to finish up, I promise. So we were working with, um, we were working with a group of people called the Bija in eastern Sudan. This is one of those things you don't know whether you want it audio on the website or not. <laughs> But I'll tell you, so I'll try to not name names. Um, there was no church among these people. Like I mentioned earlier, with Muslims, often the fringe people come to know Christ first. And so we had a small group of about 13 single men and women who had come to receive Christ. Um, they were meeting in a house in a shanty town up in Port Sudan. The neighbors got suspicious, not because they thought they were Christians, but because single men and single women were meeting in a home together. And what does that mean in that culture? It's weird. Uh, you don't do that. And so they called the police. The police came, busted the group. When they busted them, they found out that they were all Christians. Uh, in fact, uh, missionaries had even given them baptism certificates from the Lifeway bookstore and had signed those certificates. Well, one of the girls was smart enough in that while security was waiting for the rest of the church to show up, she was making coffee right here and using those baptism certificates to burn and light the coffee. So security just got one of them, but it was signed by a field missionary, which that was weird, wasn't it? I mean, where does it say in the Bible that you have to give people like a baptism certificate? But they did, and they went to jail for 30 days. 
Uh, the men were tortured, told to go back to Islam. And uh, because of that, one of our missionary families living in that area got immediately kicked out, and then we ended up getting kicked out about a year and a half later. So now when, we, when they called us in uh, to security, they just told me, they said, you have two weeks to, li to leave. I was gonna say that you have two weeks to live, you know, two weeks to leave. And I said, well, what did I do? And they said, well, we don't have to tell you that. Well, can I come back? We don't have to tell you that. Um, you know what you were doing, you know, up there. No, I, what was I doing? Anyway, that's just how it went. And that was, that's where we ended up leaving uh, Sudan, going back to Jordan. But then from Jordan, put together our teams that ended up going back into Sudan. And then we probably uh, have more people there now than ever. So I won't tell you exactly that in case somebody listens to all this. All right, let's do um, <clears throat> somebody that's listening like people do. Okay. All right, go to the second, the second sheet and let's look at, here's things I think to help, it, to help you do better. Um, top insights to before you go and while you're there. Um, number one, understand the nature of God's cross-cultural mission. To understand that this is why what you do is so amazing. When you step from your culture to another culture, you are imitating what missions calls incarnation, where Jesus left where he was and all that was his and entered our world and walked on our soil and ate our food. And you're doing that. You're, you're moving from your culture to another culture. I just love this quote by Charles Kraft. Charles Kraft was at Fuller Seminary forever, right? He's probably the top Christian anthropologist. He says, by adopting our frame of reference, God entrusts himself to us, becoming dependent on and vulnerable to us. It is our life he lives, our food he eats, our homes in which he sleeps, our difficulties that he shares, our emotions that he feels, he employs our language and culture to get his ideas across to us. And when you do that, when you step from here and get on a plane and go somewhere else, you're doing exactly the same thing. And it's a, it's a spiritual thing. And it's a remarkable thing as you live out and fulfill the Great Commission, God's gifted you guys in an incredible way. And uh, for you to be able to step across a culture and, and become dependent on those guys for that period of time that you're there, it's a real divine thing. Uh, so I, I, I think that's cool. And I think as you understand that, uh, it just adds a, another element into what you're doing. It's not just a, it's not just a deal of, well, we're going to fill some cavities. Of, of course, they need filling, you know, and we're going to repair some some cracks, but that you're participating in something that God's called you to do that's incredible. So I, I love that. Um, I think also you got to learn about as much about the culture as you can before you go. Um, some places are, are easier to do that depending on where you're living, but to meet people, study about that country, meet people from that country, eat the food, go to their grocery stores, Go to their worship if, if you have a chance. Watch their movies. Listen to their music. Uh, learn something about their culture. Increase their cultural, your cultural intelligence. And hopefully where you live, uh, you'll have opportunity to do that. Some of you that are in rural areas, not so much. For me, uh, here in, in Southern California, when I teach a missions class here, every, every session we go to a different country for lunch. So if I do a Friday, Saturday intensive on Friday and Saturdays, we're going to a different country. We're going to go to Vietnam. We're going to go to China. We're going to go to uh, Gaza. Uh, we're going to go to India and we go to those restaurants. And in those restaurants, they've got those TVs going with the stuff going on and, you know, Bollywood up there. So uh, to, to do those things, learn as much before you before you go about that country, read up on it. Um, Go to, go to cultural fairs like in, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> Pimp your hookah. <laughs> this is um, this is actually last year in Garden Grove, California. They have the Arab American Festival, and uh, if you're going to go work in the Middle East, you find these places. You know, go go do those. And just watch, you know, see how people are. And you can see right here, you got two different, in the same culture, you've got two different manifestations of that. You've got um, a woman not veiling, you got a woman veiling, and you got a person in here not veiling. So it's just a huge mix, even as you watch that. And it kind of gives you an idea that where you're going to go. I remember when we went to Jordan the first time, somebody had said, don't wear white tennis shoes. That'll give you, that's a sure sign. So we got to Jordan, everybody had white tennis shoes on. So me, I had black tennis shoes on. But if I would have gone to the, if I'd have gone to, if I'd have known something about that country before I went, I'd have, I'd have probably known. Um, you know, just restaurants um, in San Francisco when we teach classes there, it's really fun. We send people down a, a, a street in Chinatown and I just have them do sort of a scavenger hunt. I have them walk down the street, but I don't tell them that on the second and third floor of two different buildings here in Chinatown, just on a block, not any further from here to your parking lot, are two temples, but you won't find those temples unless you're looking for them. So you send them down the street and you hope that they're observant enough to figure out if you went up these steps, then you're gonna see there's a temple way up here on the top floor. So learn about those places. Uh, go to those places. Go to There's great Ethiopian restaurants right here in San Diego. In fact, one of our Doctor of Ministry students is the pastor of the Ethiopian church here in San Diego. So if you're going to go to Ethiopia, you can figure out how to get into that. So before you go, learn as much as you can about that culture and understand what's the dominant religion there. What are their primary values? Are they time or event oriented? Female, male issues? Group, individual? Uh, how open is missionary work? So, Gail, if you were in uh, Djibouti, I don't think that they were asking you to identify yourself as a missionary. You were a, a humanitarian worker, aid worker, and that's the way it is in a lot of those countries. In some countries, you can be, you know, full-blown uh, identified as a church-related missionary. But you figure that out before you go, who are you when you go into this country? Uh, third thing, work on the language. So just a little bit of the language makes you an insider. Just learn a few words. Language makes you an insider. People in America that are immigrants, they're insiders when they can speak the language. If they can't, now you appreciate them trying. You know, you want, I've had, uh, what's cool here at Golden Gate in Southern California, if, I, if I, I get to teach the preaching class, they kind of throw me a bone there, you know, since really at heart that's what I'm, I'm a preacher. Last semester, I had 17 students. I had 12 different nationalities in a preaching class. And they've all got to preach in English. So I appreciate it when a first generation Korean student tries to do his first sermon in English. Um, you know, he could do it in Korean, but if, he, if you try. So just learning a few words, people appreciate that and then they want to help you. So get a language helper even while you're here. So if you're going to go somewhere, you want to know a little bit of the language? Find somebody in town. Um, you can find somebody even it, at a mosque, a school. You think, well, I would go to a mosque to learn some Arabic? Well, why not? I mean, they're in your country. What? They're in their country. I shouldn't say that. They're, they're citizens also, and there are mosques here, and they're offering uh, Arabic classes. Why not? Uh, get, to know, get to know some Muslims before you go. Uh, go to a church that speaks that language. Watch TV from that culture. Just connect. Get friends that are from the culture that you're going to go to. Uh, gain an understanding of the purpose and the long-range strategy, the mission, where you're going to go. I think this is important. Uh, for your orientation before you go, figure out what are you going to be doing there. Now, you're going to be fixing teeth for sure. But what's the, what's the major piece of the strategy that you're going to be doing? And how, are, how is Gail's work related to the AFAR strategy?
Because I was just, I was so fascinated to hear you guys had done that just because I was connected with Jeff Pearson and the AFR work and I know a little bit about that. And I know that there's a master strategy plan to, to get the gospel to the AFR and what y'all did is a piece of that strategy. And I think it's good for you to know that, for you to be able to, sometimes you just, you know, you go in, you don't really know, how does this really relate to what's been done before and what's been done after? But if a missionary tells you guys, look, we're going to go to a place where they haven't had this before, there aren't any Christians out there, and here's how you fit into the whole thing, you know? Uh, and we want you to train a few people and give us access to go back into that place, and we want you back in again. To, to, to understand that, that's important. Um, yeah, how does your presence fit into the broader strategy? How are you going to build on work already done and yet to be done? Uh, understand, is this a harvest field or is it a planting field? Are you going to work in a country where people are all coming to the Lord or are you just planting or are you plowing? Um, do you guys remember uh, Henry Blackaby? Do you ever read his stuff, his experiencing God stuff? We were in a van with him in Cyprus years ago, talking about just work in the Middle East. And he said, you know, for somebody to get saved, generally they need to hear the gospel 10 times. And he said, are you guys willing to be number one through nine for most of your life? Uh, and that's a plowing field where people just haven't had a chance to hear the gospel. Um, are, are, so are, what are you going to be doing while you're there? Are you gaining access? Are you giving the local evangelist and the church respect, recognition, is it a reached or an unreached people group? And usually we use the, the missionaries use 2% as whether a people are reached or unreached. So if you've got a population or a people group, if it's 2% evangelical, we say that that people is reached. And then we walk away and leave that to the, they, we think the national church is strong enough to be reached. So maybe you're going to come in and strengthen the national church in a reached people group, or you're going to be like the Jordan Baptist Foundation we worked with. We would say there's a pretty good size of Palestinian and Jordanian Baptist. And we had teams come in that just supported them and gave them access to new areas. But we didn't have, uh, we didn't have a lot of missionaries connected to them. Um, so whether you're in Brazil or wherever. Okay, build relationships here and there. Uh, so this is just right down the street here in San Diego at, at Malaku's uh, restaurant. This is Malaku Makuria. This is Dan Lee. So whether it's, um, you know, Ethiopians or Koreans, depending on where you're going to go, make friends here with some of those people in the, in the countries that you're going to go to. Uh, when you're on the field, too, ask about and listen to people's stories. Just ask them. Tell me about your life. You know, how do you live? What do you believe? Ask some of those worldview questions. This is my friend Hassan. And Hassan makes this really cool meat where he lays it. He has little smooth rocks from the Nile. And he puts, he puts coal down. And he puts the rocks on top of it. And then he cooks the meat on top of the rocks. You ever seen that done? It's really cool. Wherever you go, you see people that make all kinds of interesting foods. Which is why I say, eat the food. Be as local as you can. Identify with people. I've, I've seen short-term missionaries who bring cliff bars and canned peaches. You know, and they, yeah, they have them in their backpack. And that's all they eat. Why? Well, you know, I don't want to get sick and I don't want to eat that. Well, what if somebody puts something in front of you? You know, you're going to eat it or not? Um, are you going to identify with those people? Or are you going to say, no. You know, I mean, what is that? How does that communicate if you say, I'm no, I'm not going to eat your food? Now, one of the weirdest things I ever saw, though, was um, me and two volunteers from Kansas City were up in Sudan on the Nile, and we were visiting this guy whose five year old son, let's see, yeah, his five year old son and his eight year old daughter had just gotten circumcised on the same day. Okay, imagine this. Eight-year-old daughter, five-year-old son, both got circumcised. We're visiting. He's excited. Uh, we sit in the room. We sit in the room with the son and the daughter, which was a little awkward. Um, visit with them. He comes in, and he's got an antifreeze jug with ice in it. And we're thinking, wow, that's hard to come by up here in the middle of the Nile. 
And um, he comes around and there's one cup and he pours the cup. And as he pours the ice water into the cup, I notice there's sediment in the bottom of the, of the antifreeze jar, you know. Now, you know, your first question is, well, what do I do with this? Do I say, no, it's okay, I've got my water in the backpack. And probably, you know, to be safe uh, and, you know, medically sound, you would say that. But I just thought, you know what, help me, Lord. There you go. I've had, I've had Giardia and I've had uh, the other one that's worse before. Yeah, so I just drank it and uh, passed it on to the two volunteers. And of course, now they're looking at me going, what? <laughs> the one guy, you know, takes it, drinks it. The third guy, he drinks it. The man leaves. The second guy goes to his backpack and he's got some of those little pills that are supposed to, you know, clear water. He grabs a bottle out of his backpack, throws some of those in his throat and drinks it down. <laughs> thinking it's gonna, you know, clean up whatever's there. Just, so you make those decisions, you know. And I know you've eaten some weird things. That's one good thing really about working with Muslims is Muslims eat like halal food. It's sort of like Old Testament food. It's gotta be done a certain way. If you're working in, you know, some other places like in Asia where they eat like anything, in fact, they used to say in China, if it, if, it's, if it has four legs, they'll eat it. Even if it's a chair or a table, you know, they're going to eat it. Um, but you, you just, you know, eat, eat the food, be as local as you can, uh, and go to these restaurants here uh, before you go. And in fact, there's something, I think, something spiritual about sharing a meal together. I'm really onto this right now. I don't know why, but I, it's, it's, it's just been something I've been thinking about. And maybe it's because in American culture, We've kind of gone to where meals are all about being practical. Less calories, good food. You know, the whole purpose is to sustain life. And that's okay. But there's something spiritual about food too. That is more than just calories to sustain life. But there's something about being together with meals. Uh, and, and on the field, you can do that. Like if you're in Honduras... You can go to Subway, you can go to Wendy's, and there, sure, there's Hondurans there. Uh, or you can eat a biryani on the floor with some people uh, in Iraq and, um, you know, eat with, with um, the group sitting around the mat and be local. Um, okay, you gotta, the seventh thing I, I would say is figure out how you're going to respond to poverty. And wherever you go, probably... You're going you're gonna to see poverty, whether it's in Haiti. Somebody mentioned Haiti. I, I'd been a lot of places in the world, and then when I went to Haiti, it was like one of the worst places I've ever been. It's just right here. It's like right by, right by Orlando. Seriously, you leave Disney World, and you get on the plane, and the next thing you know, you're in this place that's it's worse than Ethiopia. It's worse than any place I'd been. Um, so you're going to figure out how you're going to respond to that and find a balance uh, of how you're going to respond and resist the, the temptation to just help this one person. Now, why is that? Because if you help that one person, what if this kid, you know, is in a group culture and he's the one that gets the good tennis shoes and he's the one that's got all the missionary attention and when he gets back after you guys are gone, everybody beats the fire out of him and takes it. So you got to figure all that out. How do you really help? And, and ask the local people too, how do you really help those people? And, and how do you respond to poverty uh, and respond in a way that sustains the dignity of the person? Such as uh, if you're going to go deliver food, if you're in a culture where the man, uh, you, you may, if you're in a culture where the man is going to feel shamed by you showing up and him, you know, feeling like I'm shamed that I can't take care of my family. Think about that. So how do you do that? How do you, how do you give food or give ministry in different cultures? But respond to it that shows Christ likeness is culturally relevant, is sustainable. Uh, and you just have to figure that out. And it's tough. And when you're on the field, it's tough because you go like this. I mean, there's some days uh, where, you know, people would, um, would just, you, you see beggars all the time. 
and people that are deformed and people that are needy and you know that you can help them and you just have to figure out before you go, how are you going to respond to that? Um, all right, let me just, let me move on. I was, I was going to tell you one more. I had, all right, I'll tell you the toss in the bowl. So in Sudan, we, um, I could get a, I could get a USA Today newspaper twice a week off the Lufthansa flight. And I had a friend that worked at the airport, so he'd grab the newspapers and at a particular intersection in the city, I'd stop and he would come to my car and I could buy the newspaper. I'd give him a dollar and I got a USA Today, like that was only two days old. That was great. So um, one day we were there and as you stop, I'm looking for my guy and people are shoving oranges into the car. Have you guys ever seen those things? They're shoving cigarettes and oranges and everything else in the car. And there's this one boy, and he's, he's on the side of my window, and he's just hitting the, the window with uh, his bowl. There's a group of these guys, but the one boy's there just hitting constantly. And uh, it was just beginning to irritate me like that's irritating you right now. And so I rolled the window down. I said, give me your bowl. And he's like, what? I, he hands the bowl in, and I take the bowl and roll the window up. Now I have his bowl. Now I, I negotiate with my deal. I get my paper. I drive about 50 yards. I roll the window down. I sling his bowl out the window. And uh, my wife says, what did you do? And I said, I don't know. And I drove about another 100 yards. I made a U-turn through the traffic. I came back around. And now the little boy is standing on the wall with his group of beggar buddies. And... Um, I go to the near place and an old man comes over and I said, I need to see just that boy. And so he goes over and brings him and I talk to the boy and I'm saying, I am so sorry that I tossed your bowl. And uh, he just starts smiling. I said, you know, just forgive me. I shouldn't have done that. You know, I'm sorry. Jesus wouldn't have done that. And uh, just talk to him for a second. And of course I give him, you know, like 250 pounds. And I said, don't tell him, you know, uh, but just, you know, go on. But you, that's always there. When you go to most of these places, poverty is always there, and you have to figure out how do you sustain, how do you deal with it um, without tossing the bowl and without getting dependency. Um, number eight, I say be aware of some cultural things in your, own, in your own culture that could be a stumbling block to the gospel. So some things that you might be doing that are a stumbling block. Habits, uh, inappropriate cultural practices, photos. You know, sometimes we think, this is the only photo in my whole group I didn't take, but I think it's just so bizarre, <laughs> these two guys. But uh, photos, sometimes we don't think much about it, just clicking away, you know? Hey, get in there, get that. And think about how, how appropriate is it? Male and female interaction, um, how we respond to food and waste. What are we doing with our food? Values of time. So just things about us that might clash with theirs. And then discover cultural bridges and barriers to sharing the gospel. In every culture you're going to go to, you're going to find that there are certain bridges that help you share more easily. And that culture is just setting you up to be able to, just like Jesus... Uh, look around and just say, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like this. Uh, for instance, here's one in Sudan. In, in Sudan and in any, anywhere you work with Muslims, you have the, uh, the Eid al-Adha, which is the feast of sacrifice. This is where Muslims celebrate uh, Abraham being willing to offer Ishmael, his son, as a sacrifice. You've all heard that story, right? <laughs> right. Um, and so uh, what you do on the Eid al-Adha is you commemorate that, and you've got the sheep. This is a Sudanese sheep. It kind of looks like a cross between a Holstein and a, you know, a burrow or something. Uh, but this is it. And so you take, when you go buy a sheep, uh, you, you buy the butcher with it. So the butcher is sitting on the side of the road next to the guy selling the sheep. You buy the sheep. You bring the butcher home. Um, and he gets your sheep, he runs it out to the street, he cuts it in the neck, and he says, Bismillah, faces it toward Mecca. 
and uh, you just sit there like we're doing right here, just watching. Everybody watches. Um, and then you, uh, you take that sheep and you, you eat it. And the question that I ask Muslims is, you don't, you don't debate, was it really Ishmael? Or wasn't that Isaac? Doesn't the Bible say it was Isaac? Well, it doesn't matter what the Bible says because Jews and Christians change the Bible. You know that, right? You can't trust the Bible. So you just take what the Quran says and what the Hadith says, that it was actually Abraham and Ishmael. But who cares? Don't even ask about that. All you do, the bridge you're going to look for is, how come you guys have to cut the neck of the sheep? What's the sacrifice for? Why do you spill blood? Why do you have to offer a sacrifice? Is it because there's holy God and sinful man? And how, do you, how does holy God be right with sinful man? And I let the Ishmael part you know, play out later. Um, because Muslims grow up believing that, that Christians and Jews change the Bible. You can't trust the Bible. Now, when they did that, they can't tell you. But looking for bridges and barriers, like Jesus just said, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And as you guys are sitting around Central America or South America or Europe or Africa or Asia, and you're just seeing things that are happening, you're able to say, you know, it's kind of like this. It's, it's just, this is a picture of what the kingdom's like. And then 10th, I just say, get some orientation before you go and debrief after. So get somebody to tell you a little bit about what are we going to do? How's this fit? Where are we going to go? And then when you get back, talk about it. What went well? What could we have done differently? How, how did that whole thing work? And just remember that experience doesn't make you a good short-term missionary. Evaluated experience makes you a good short-term missionary. Just the fact that you've been places. We had people in our organization that just counted how many stickers they had in their passport. And then you start getting really pharisaical about that. Like, if you fly through Saudi Arabia, but you don't get off, you don't get out of the airport, does that count? And I had some friends that say, yeah, it counts. Because what if you committed a crime in Saudi Arabia? at the airport, where would they take you? Would, what jail would you be in? What country? Yeah, and so they would count that. And so they say, no, I haven't been to, I've been to 68 countries because I actually flew through the airport in Saudi Arabia. And I actually had an experience there where I almost stayed in Saudi Arabia because in my check luggage going to Sudan, I had a Swiss army knife that my boys had given me and it had a little cross on it. And the Saudis found it in my luggage, my checked luggage. I was just transferring planes, and they called me into security, and they said, you can't have this knife in Saudi Arabia. I said, I'm not in Saudi Arabia. They said, yes, you are. There you go. It validated my friend that said, if you're at the airport, you're there. Yeah. And they said, well, you cannot take this knife. You can't take this knife with you. And I said, it's in my checked luggage. And they said, no, uh, you, just, you can't take it. And I said, well, then if the knife, this was, I'd been out on the field now like three and a half years. I'm ready to go home. And I said, well, if the knife stays, then I'm going to stay. And they're like, what? And I said, no, I'll just sit here. They're like, okay. So I stay. I'm just having tea. And I just sat there for an hour or so. And I think they really believed it. And so they came back and they said, okay, it can, it can go under the plane in your luggage, which is where it was. <laughs> so... That's that. Okay. Um, okay. That's that's the that's the two pages, and that's more than my time. Um, I've gone real fast, and I know y'all know a lot of that. And what? Anything? Another five minutes? You want to ask a question or so? And I'll I'll give you. Yeah, I'll leave you in five minutes or so. And if not, um, uh, you can find me. If you're ever interested in at Golden Gate Seminary, it's just my name, Eddie Pate, uh, at ggbts.edu. Okay, yeah. Did you have a cross-cultural shock when you came back? You and your family came back to the U.S. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think just because of how much stuff is here. Uh huh, and you know, especially the boys. You know, they're used. To, MKs have a hard time adjusting. Um, but yeah, it was hard. Like, how do you select a cereal at the grocery store? That was a hard thing. 
Uh, and then learning, learning cultural things again, like to relate to men and women and gestures. Like in the Middle East, if you're, like, let's say you're backing up in a parking lot at, at your grocery store and somebody else is backing up, you would normally in our culture just kind of roll the window down and put your hand out like this. And this, all this means is to stand the shwaya, wait just a second. And it's not a mean thing. It's just like, hold on, you know, give me just a minute. And of course, if you do this in America to somebody, they're going to come out, what are you doing? So learning those little things over again, too, is, is tough. Uh, but the good thing about it is, you know, like in my job right now, it's the easiest job I've ever had in my life because... I've had, you know, when you, we worked in the Middle East, I'd have teams, we had volunteer teams in Gaza. I remember two in the morning, uh, somebody calls me from Gaza and this says, hey, our volunteer team's here. There's Israeli tanks in the streets. They're shooting. We've got mattresses up against the windows. The team's lying on the floor. We haven't heard anything for a few minutes and then boom, you hear a sound and they're like, we're gonna lay back down, I'll call you later. <laughs> so when you have dealt, I mean, when that's been your like normal day, um, when you come back to America, if I have students that, you know, are getting B's and they think they should get an A, whatever, I don't care, <laughs> you know? Um, I had to, seriously, I had to go see somebody at church the other night, and I remember, this is a guy that they'd had a little conflict on a youth tour, and I had to go visit this guy, and somebody at church said, oh, I'll be praying for you as you go visit that guy, and I said, why? What? what? Well, it's going to be a tough visit. No, it's not. It's not a tough visit. Uh, I started gaining a little more weight when I had a volunteer team in northern Iraq. They were, this was right when the war was going on, and we had this team there, and a girl called me. She said, um, it's 11 o'clock here in northern Iraq, and our team went out this afternoon on a hike, and they're not back yet. Should I be concerned? I had 21 volunteers up there in northern Iraq. My team leader let them go on a hike. I said, yeah, you go down to the Army right now. And uh, two hours later, they call me back, and they said, yeah, we found them. They were, the Army found them. They were 50 meters from a minefield on the top of this mountain. So I talked to my, my team leader guy, and I'm like, David, what are you guys doing? He goes, I'm sorry, man. We just thought it was going to be a, you know, like an hour hike, and this Iraqi guy got us all messed. I'll call you in the morning. He calls me in the morning, and he says, you know the girl, Jennifer, that called you last night? I'm like, yeah. He said, she has multiple sclerosis, and she never told anybody, and she hasn't urinated in three days, and her kidneys are shutting down. What should I do? I said, David, get her. You know, get her here. We flew her back to Amman. We take her to the hospital in Amman. Um, they say, oh, you're fine. Our medical person from the IMB says, no, get her home quick. We send her back to Houston. They take a kidney out. Yeah, and I've got my team in Iraq thinking this is like Switzerland. It's the sound of music going on in Austria here. You know, no. So anyway, the biggest thing and the good thing has been when you come back to America, um, you know, things, sometimes things that we think are huge just aren't that big a deal. Um, let me tell you one more story. Okay, yeah, and I'll tell you one more story and I'll shut up. Yeah, please. Um, <laughs> but, but since, uh, we're just clumsy Americans and we don't know better. And yet, you know, can they just cut us a little slack? Um, <laughs> yeah, I was looking. What they should do is um, they should give you some orientation. I thought I had it here, but I don't. That Where you're going to go should give you a little bit of orientation on here's some do's and don'ts. Here's how to do it better. And you know what? None of us are, none of us are experts in it. I mean, I, if I go to a new country, the first thing I want to do is just watch and just be kind. Um, just be, try to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit 
and and be led by the Holy Spirit and then just let God work it out. And um, usually it does. As long as you're a learner when you go, I think it's okay. I mean, none of us are going to be experts at all that. Right. It seems like maybe there could be some little, like they say, just cut us a little slack because we may. Yeah. Have, we're Americans. Yeah. So kind of and, and that's true. But I think that's why the best, the most effective short term teams, I, I think, are teams that connect with long term local strategy on the ground. And then that guy should give you. I'd be surprised when you guys went with the AFR if they didn't give you some kind of briefing beforehand on what you were doing and what this was all about. They should. They didn't? They did. Okay. Um, hey, let me just tell you one more story. It's a, it's a Muslim story, but I think it's fun. Um, and I, it's not related to anything. So <laughs> it's a good way for, for me to make my exit. Um, <clears throat> we found that most Muslims that got saved uh, got saved through a dreamer of vision that led them to scripture, that led them to Jesus. Those three things, the, the scripture has to be a part of it. If they didn't get to scripture, they never got to Jesus. Um, and so a buddy of my, mine, uh, in fact, Hamid, this guy that is in this one uh, photo, he and I collected about 30 different dream stories from northern Sudan. And um, let me just tell you one, and then I'll go. I was going to try to show you his, oh, yeah, there we go, his picture. This guy right here. Um, so let's see. This is, this is one of my favorite ones. He, um, there was a guy on the Nile, and he was on a little boat. And in his dream, he had a bunch of Quranic books, and he saw Jesus walk on the, on the Nile, and Jesus took all of the Quranic books, threw them in the water, and gave him a Bible and said, read this, this is the word of life. He wakes up, goes to the mosque the next day, and he tells the imam what happened, and the imam says, that's just Satan trying to mess with your mind, don't pay any attention to that. So he goes about his day, goes home that night, lays down, he has the exact same dream. He's on the Nile on a boat, he's got a bunch of Quranic books, Jesus walks over, takes those books, throws them in the water, gives him a Bible and says, read this, this is the word of life. He wakes up the next morning and he goes to, the, to his work. Now, he is so poor that he sells cigarettes and he sells them by the piece and if he sells them by the piece, then he, he has enough money where he can buy himself a new pack of cigarettes. I'm going to show you that fool bowl. Let's see. He can buy himself, uh, 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 by selling the pack of cigarettes, he can buy himself a bowl of, of fool to eat for the day, and he can have enough money to buy another pack of cigarettes and go through the next day. So that's how he lived. So he's in the marketplace selling cigarettes by the piece, and he thinks, how can I find this in Jeel? And he looks and the guy next to him is reading something. The guy next to him selling lighters, reading something. He says, what are you reading? And the guy says, I'm reading an Injil. He goes, where did you get that? He goes, well, here, do you want mine? So he says, sure. So he gives him his book. The guy with the lighters walks away. He never saw him before, never saw him since. He reads scripture for six months, gets saved as a result of that, and then comes and connects with our guys in town. But that's, that's what we see happening. And you see God working with these people too in dreams and some of them don't get to that point like my friend that was making the stuff on the rocks that you saw he had a dream and Jesus appeared to him and said go to the marketplace put a water canteen under your jalabia and a man will come up to you and say uh, give me a drink and that man will tell you everything you need to know about me and so I said Hassan did you go and he goes no and I said why not he goes what if that man would have really been there no he was afraid so anyway, those are, those are stories you connect to. Again, thank you guys for the time. I am in awe and appreciate what you're doing. I'd love to go with y'all sometime, somewhere. Keep me on the list, please, y'all. And uh, can I just pray? And we'll, yeah? Okay, let me just, let me close my part with prayer. 
Our Heavenly Father, uh, just we just thank you for being a part of the family of God and the body of Christ and how diverse that is and how talented that is. And I thank you for men and women that you've called and the difference that you're making in real uh, compassion ministries where people can smile and people have uh, are pain-free uh, in their, their mouths through people that are in this room and p- the difference that they've made all over the world. And I just thank you for their obedience to you and their commitment to the Great Commission. God, just continue to open doors, we would pray, and help us to, to go to places uh, where few have gone, where they've yet to hear the gospel. Lord, I just ask your blessing on this group that you'd use them in a mighty way and bless the work that they're doing. Thank you for the time we've had together, and we just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.